All right, Marriage Prep 101, getting ready for the big day. This is lesson number nine. What makes a marriage Christian? So we focused a lot of our uh, material on the relational part of marriage. You know, being ready, choosing the right partner, make e making each other happy, so on and so forth. So today I want to examine the spiritual side of marriage by asking what makes a marriage Christian? You know, a lot of people uh, who are not members of the church have come to me nevertheless in order to be married. It happens all the time. If you're a minister, people you know, just off the street, especially uh, in Montreal where uh, we were for many years. And these people, you know, they've, uh, they've never been to church. They're not church people. They don't go to church. They don't read the Bible. They have no convictions about Jesus Christ one way or another, but they want a church wedding. You know, they want a church wedding. They don't go to church, but they want a church wedding. In other words, I, think, I don't think they, they're able to articulate it, but what they want is they want a spiritual element or they want a blessing from God on their union. And I think the reason for this is that people have been raised to believe that churches or holy men, you know, ministers, priests, rabbis, whatever, we're the ones that give the stamp of approval to marriages or we make them okay in God's eyes. Seems to be that, that thinking. A kind of a, a religious seal of approval or authority. To the, you know, it's like now it's a real, it's a real marriage because you know, we were married in a church, we were married by our rabbi or we were married by a minister. The truth, however, is that marriages are acceptable in God's eyes if they are entered into by men and women consciously and legally, period. That's it. The ceremonies may differ from country to country, but this element is always present. If this were not so, then every Hindu or Muslim or non-believer would be living in adultery in God's eyes, since none of these are married in a Christian church. Think about that for a second. So if it's between a man and a woman and it's consensual and it's legal according to society, then it's acceptable in God's eyes. That's an acceptable marriage in God's eyes. Now, as Christians, however, we not only search that our marriages be consensual and legal, we also create the type of marriages that reflect the will and the purpose of our Lord Jesus Christ. So yeah, there's an element to a Christian marriage that isn't present in just a marriage between you know, people who got married at City Hall, have no religious convictions. They're married in God's eyes, legitimately, but they don't have a Christian marriage, okay? So uh, being married inside of a church building is not what makes your marriage a godly one. Actually, it's building your marriage according to God's plan that makes your marriage a Christian one, one that's in accordance to God's plan. So in the very beginning of the Bible, God gives us three basic elements in His plan for marriage in general. It's in Genesis chapter two, verses 18 to 25. So I want to review these three and see if they exist you know, in our own marriages. So the first element that God requires for a marriage is knowledge of self. That's the first element in a Christian or in a godly marriage, knowledge of self. Let's read Genesis two, he says, or uh, Moses writes, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. Knowledge of self, remember that's our first element. Notice here that Adam was taught about his environment and himself. He was an adult person in touch with his world and his own emotions, his own needs. Through his experience and knowledge, he recognized that he was alone and incomplete in this state. I mean, you know, he saw all the animals, 
male and female this, male and female that. You know, he's all the animals, all the creatures, you know, and it says none of those were suitable for him. You know, he, 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 he recognized that, yeah, these are all these creatures and they're all wonderful, but they're, you know, they're not like me. They're not suitable for me. Note that God didn't create woman immediately. He gave Adam time to know himself, to know his surroundings and his sense of aloneness. Now I mention this because the basic teaching in the Bible about self-knowledge and marriage is echoed by marriage counselors today. Marriage counselors tell us that the best time to get married is when we have reached a certain ideal level of both social and emotional preparedness. Let me explain. Social readiness. So the knowledge of self should include social readiness. You're socially ready for marriage when you have some idea of what you want in life and where you want to go. You're socially ready when you formulated some of your own convictions about things. When you've learned to function within society independently. In other words, you may love and respect your parents, but you are now taking care of yourself by yourself. That's one of the definitions of social readiness. And then there's also emotional readiness. You're ready for marriage when you're emotionally ready. And you're emotionally ready for marriage when you recognize your need for marriage. Not what your parents want, not what your beloved wants, but what you want for yourself. In other words, you are emotionally ready for marriage when you're prepared to stop being alone. This is important because some people want to marry, but they continue to live and think as single people. That's not good for marriage. So you're emotionally ready when you are ready to make a full and lifetime commitment. You're ready and you want to do it. If you have to be talked into it by your partner, if you have to be coerced by your family and your friends to get married, you're not ready emotionally. You know, if you get married because you're tired of your mom saying, you ought to get married, it's time for you to get, you know, if, if that's why you get married, that's the wrong reason. And moms should know better. Now what often happens is that you have two people and four variables, but four variables that don't match. For example, he is ready socially, you know, he's got a job and all this business here, but he's not ready emotionally. She's ready emotionally, I want to be married, I want to have children, I want to start, you know, she's ready emotionally, but she's not ready socially. Still living with her parents, depending on her mom to pay for her stuff, you know. And a lot of times the match doesn't light because one or more of the variables are not in place. The ideal situation is that both partners have to be socially and emotionally ready to marry. Now back in Genesis 2, we see that Adam was ready socially because he knew his position, his role in life, and he was ready emotionally because he understood that he needed and wanted a partner to complete his life. And in his majesty and wisdom, God created woman who was exquisitely made both socially and emotionally to perfectly complement Adam. So in God's plan for marriage, because we're talking about God's plan for marriage here, right? In God's plan for marriage, the partners know themselves and they know their position within God's creation, they're also ready and willing to leave their single status to enter into the lifetime commitment of marriage. If uh, you know, a month before your wedding, you're, you're weeping because you're giving up your single status, you better think twice. You know. <laughs> if you can't think of any of all the good things that marriage is going to bring you, and the only thing you're thinking about is what you're leaving behind as a single person, you need to maybe put on the brakes you know, and reassess. I know for you know, this crowd that <laughs> 
Anyway, it's good advice that you can pass on. Uh, so God's plan for marriage. Number one, knowledge of self. Second element, knowledge of the partner. Knowledge of the partner. Let's read, let's go back to Genesis. Verse 21, it says, So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now I'm not sure about the idea of having one partner especially created for another one. You know, one soul in the whole world, there's just one soulmate you know, suitable for you. That that's, makes a nice movie. I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's true. I think Adam and Eve were the only ones like this, you know, for obvious reasons. I do know, however, that um, only one man was designed to be with one woman. That part we're pretty sure of. Not men with men or women with women, not three women and one man, you know, and nowadays you know, five people together in a group marriage. You know, this is not what God designed. This is what man invents, but it's not what God designed. This being said, I know that the goal of uh, these one man, one woman uh, combination is that they become one and the only way this goal uh, can be accomplished is through the knowledge of the person we intend to marry. Very important. Now in every society, the road from being single to being married is different. I mean, all kinds of combinations. You know. To get you from being single to married, is, is one way in the United States and it's a whole other way in India, it's a whole other way in China. You know, the, every society has its way of moving a single person uh, from being single to eventually being, uh, to being uh, uh, married. There are prearranged marriages, for example. You, many of us think, oh yeah, that's back in the Middle Ages. No, 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 that happened. I knew in Montreal there was a, an Indian, East Indian uh, brother who was there and he was married, he was telling me his story that he met his wife when he was, I think, 15 and she was 14. Met her once. Then they emigrated to Canada, his family. She stayed there in India. And they corresponded for like eight years, back and forth, letter writing, and then of course, you know, as computers developed, you know, then they emailed and FaceTimed. You know, that, that was it, that was their thing. Then he went back and married her. And they had 700 people at their wedding. <laughs> and of course, I, I did not know him as they went through all of this. I only knew them as the married couple, already married couple with a, uh, with a child, you know, and I think a second one on the way. And uh, you know, very happy. And they were telling us this story. And I, I was fascinated. I would ask, ask them questions about that. Yeah, I know it's unusual to the mindset of, of, of Americans or Canadians and this. You know, they wouldn't think of doing things that way, but that's how our society does things. They were quite comfortable with it. He says, I knew who she was. I've been, we've been talking for eight years. We've been talking for eight years. Uh, in other places, long courtships and engagements. Other societies or cultures, family introductions, very important. Very, very important family introduction. Who's his father? Who's his mother? And you know, what, what clan do they belong to or whatever? Pen pals, internet correspondence, today internet dating. More and more I meet people who have met online. But in the end, the thing that we want to do is to get to know the other person. Whatever system you use, these systems, these social systems have been developed to help people know each other before they, before they get married. This is an important part of the marriage sequence because it is through this process that we establish not only a material contract, you know, like with a dowry or a marriage contract, not only is, is that the basis of, of this contract, it's also the way that we establish um, an emotional contract as well. Because there are two contracts 
going on in marriage. One is the material, you know, everything's together. You know, we have a marriage license, we have, a, you know, we have the laws protect our family, we own this home together, all that kind of you know, legal contract that we have. But we also have an emotional contract that we've made with one another, usually represented in the vows that we take you know, at, the, uh, at, the marriage, uh, at the marriage ceremony. Two people who know their environment and who know themselves need to spend time learning to know each other. And it is during this effort to know each other that the couple lays down the groundwork for their unity or their oneness, the rules. Now the greatest problem here that confronts people in our society is that we are bombarded with the notion that having sex is the only and best way to really know somebody else. I mean, in a thousand different ways, our society kind of gets this message across, especially to younger people, younger unmarried people. The truth, however, is that engaging in sex before the commitment to marry usually hampers us in the effort to really know the other person. It's the opposite that happens. You see, sex was designed by God to do a lot of things, okay? For example, through sex, we confirm our commitment, our commitment to our oneness. Let's face it, the intimacy involved, the closeness involved, the revealing involved in sexual union between a man and a woman says, we're one, we're, you, know, you can't get any closer physically, you're part of each other during that moment. And so through sex, God has designed this act to confirm our commitment to one another, to our, to our oneness. We express loyalty, I am yours, and you are mine. And we express that idea without words, through sexuality. Through sex, we surrender ourselves. I'm not only yours, I'm all yours. All I have is yours, and all you have belongs to me. Through this activity, we establish family, of course. We comfort each other emotionally. In other words, we comfort each other without words. And those who have been married for a time understand exactly what I'm talking about here. And of course, God created sex to provide for physical pleasure and intimate enjoyment and fun and play. Man didn't invent that idea that, oh wow, this is fun. <laughs> oh great, this feels good. We didn't invent that, God invented that for us. There's nothing about sex that God doesn't know. Okay, he knows everything about it. Now here's my point. We're not usually ready to do all of these things, you know, express loyalty, surrender self, establish. We're not usually ready to do all of these things with somebody we don't know very well. And so when we engage in sex before marriage, it usually is not much more than for physical gratification that eventually becomes emotionally and spiritually confusing and painful because we cannot do these other things with a one night stand. We cannot do these other things with the guy we met at the party last weekend and we're going away together this weekend and you know. I'm not, I'm not ready to surrender self to somebody I've only known for 48 hours. See what I'm saying? There are much better and less risky ways to know somebody than to enter into you know, sexual intimacy with them. So Adam, go back to our Genesis passage, Adam was ready socially, he was ready emotionally, and God fashioned for him a perfectly matched partner. And in the pre-sin world of the garden, Adam immediately recognized the suitability of God's final act of creation, which was Eve. In other words, Adam knew her completely and she knew him exactly in the same way. So these two were ready for the commitment because they knew each other in perfect wisdom and understanding as only ones who were without sin could have. Imagine, imagine the unity that they enjoyed. Imagine the intimacy that they enjoyed, no sin getting in the way of anything. No pride, no ego. 
We therefore should take special care in getting to know our prospective mates because unlike Adam and Eve, uh, we are marrying weak and sinful people. You know, Adam was marrying something perfect, someone perfect, and she was marrying someone perfect, but we marry imperfect, sinful people, and we are like that ourselves. And so knowing the strengths and weaknesses of the other enables us to go into, marriage, uh, into a marriage commitment with our eyes wide open, and that's what God wants. All right, I said there were three elements. Third element, knowledge of self, knowledge of partner, unity. And remember our original idea, what is God's plan for marriage? What is God's plan for marriage? Knowledge of self, knowledge of partner, unity. So we know ourselves, we know the other person, now we need to know what we're getting into when we get married. Marriage is a uniting of two people into a lifetime relationship that only death can legitimately end. It can end in divorce, but that's an unlit, un, not a legitimate way in God's eyes to break up a marriage. I know that there's some that teach, you know, uh, you're never divorced, you're always married to the person you're married to, but that's, that's, a, that's a Catholic idea that crept into the church a couple hundred years ago. When you, when you get a legal divorce, you're divorced from that person in society's eyes and in God's eyes as well. The Bible says you shouldn't divorce. It's a sin if you divorce. It doesn't say it's impossible to divorce. It's just like the Bible says, you shall not steal, right? But does that mean it's impossible to steal? Well, no, of course not. It's possible to steal. The Bible says you shouldn't do it. In the same way, the Bible says you shouldn't divorce. Why? It's a sin. It's breaking of the vows and so on and so forth. But the Bible doesn't say it's impossible to do. Of course, you know, if man wants to break God's command, he can do it if he wants to. He just suffers the consequences of it. All right. So unity is what we're creating here. Now, we know that marriage involves a ceremony and a legal contract, a personal promise or a commitment. But these are the things that accompany or legitimize or that sanction a marriage in society and in God's eyes. But in the end, when you say, I do, what you're saying is, I do promise to live with you as your spouse until I die. That's the promise I'm making. This is a high and noble thing, but very difficult for weak and sinful people to accomplish. So the Lord gives us three small rules to follow in verses 24 and 25 of Genesis to help cement the union for a lifetime. So we read in verses 24 and 25. He says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. You see the three little rules there to help cement union or unity? Rule number one, you have to separate in order to unite. You need to leave your parents if you're to cleave, that's the word in the King James, I like that word, cleave means to be glued to your spouse. The commitment in marriage is to be glued to your partner, not your parents, not your buddies, not your work, not your mates, not your hobbies, not your career. When you decide to marry, the decision is to make your partner the priority over family, friends, hobbies, work, whatever. You cannot have unity without priority of the spouse. Long after your parents are gone, your job is finished, your career is over, your hobbies are boring, long after all those things are finished, you're still with your spouse. That's, that's the one thing that lasts until, it's the only thing you're committed to until you die, is your spouse, nothing else. Well, the Lord, the Lord, of course. So you can't have this unity if you don't make your spouse the priority. She or he has to be the priority. So you have to separate to unite. And I mean, I could, you know, we could jam on this for an hour, all the problems that happen because people don't do this. Their loyalty, you know, they get married, but their loyalty is still back with their original family or their loyalty is to their job. Okay, I'm married, we had the honeymoon, I gotta, I gotta get back to my career now. As if a wife or a husband is just a kind of a, you know, a, a, a satellite that kind of goes around 
you know, the, the main part of your life, which is your career. We don't understand that. No, 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 the main part of your life now is your spouse. <laughs> your career is a satellite and your hobbies are satellites and your family's a satellite. But your spouse and your own family that you produce, that becomes the center, that becomes your world. And that's not just marriage advice, that's, that's how God created us to be. Second rule, unity rules. Permanent is permanent. You become one flesh, there's no room for any other flesh. In the one flesh, the couple don't necessarily think and act alike, that's not what that means. One flesh means that both partners are absolutely committed to the union that they are both a part of. I appreciate my wife because she consistently demonstrates loyalty to our marriage. To me, yes, of course, you know, she's for me. Sometimes she criticizes me because of something that I've done which is not correct or I'm not living up to what I want to be, whatever. You know. But she's always loyal to our marriage, totally devoted to it as I want to be uh, as well. And that's important. You don't give up identity, but you do give up independence. You don't give up your identity. You are who you are. You express who you are, the way you are, you know, the things you love, the things that are important. You, know, you don't give up your identity, who you are, but you do give up your independence. The whole, of, the whole idea of marriage is to the two become one. You become dependent on one another. Not codependence, that's a different thing, that's unhealthy. Codependence is when you facilitate somebody else's bad habits. That's not the same thing. I mean, you're dependent on one another. Life has many stages. Marriage is designed to bring people together through each of life's marker points, both happy and sad. You know, Lise was there the night my mom died. I was with my mom when she died. The moment she died, we both saw it together. Last thing she did, she looked over at the time on the clock. My mother, she just turned over, looked at the time, it was 2 a.m. And then she turned over and died. Lise was there that night. And I was there for her when her father died. And you know, we, we've been through stuff together. Babies being born, moves, how many moves? <laughs> Lots of moves. Well, that's what marriage is for. We, we've done all this stuff together. Waited up for our children when they came home late at night. Yeah. Watched our girls you know, get married and then leave. You know, that's a hard moment. Our little girls gone you know, with their husbands. You know, happy, adult, in charge of their lives, going forward. So we shed a few tears together too. Tears of sadness, tears of happiness, but that's marriage, that's what it's for. Your job doesn't keep you company when your daughter gets married. You see what I'm saying? You, you, may, be a, you may be a champion bowler, I'll go back to my bowling uh, imagery here. You may be a champion bowler, but you know, that means absolutely zero. When, you're, when your son says, dad, they found a lump you know, in my throat, I have to go for a biopsy. Yeah, being a champion bowler, yeah, doesn't do anything for you at that moment. At that moment, you're reaching out for your wife or your, your spouse. That's why permanent is permanent. And then the third rule that helps the unity, right? We have to realize, we have to separate to unite, realize. Permanent means permanent. And then three, intimacy is without fear. The final verse says, they were naked and unashamed. The word naked here doesn't simply mean without clothing. It means they were laid bare before one another. Adam and Eve were totally honest. They expressed openly their feelings. They had no reservations about their sexuality because they were without sin and totally transparent with each other. God created uh, sexual intimacy and He placed it, notice, He placed sexual intimacy last 
not first, on the foundation of knowledge of self, knowledge of the other person, commitment to unity, and then sexual intimacy last. When these elements are placed in this order, then the marriage reflects the shape and the form that God intended for marriage to be. And it has a great opportunity to be a happy one. You know, why, why do parents continually you know, encourage their, their young, you know, their, their teenage uh, children you know, to, to, to be careful, you know, to, you know, uh, sex before marriage, don't do that. Don't, you know, they only say, don't do that, don't do that. But you know, young people need to understand why. Because it's so alluring, they're in love, they're full of health and vitality. You know? why, why should I wait? You know, if I love the person, if I'm attracted, why shouldn't I? You know? Well, this is a long explanation here. You can't just come back in five words, cause I say so. But there is a very good reason why. Because God you know, designed the marriage relationship in such a way that it's fragile. You, 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 can, you can harm it by getting all of these things out of, out of sequence. Now, in this lesson, we've looked at ways to turn an ordinary marriage into a Christian marriage. So far, what I've done uh, is give you the three basic elements in God's original plan for marriage. Know yourself, know the other person, make a lifetime commitment to unity. If you follow this plan, it, it doesn't necessarily make your marriage a Christian one, because a lot of people of all religions or no religion have followed this plan right here and succeeded in having a happy, and fulfilling marriage. And in this we see God's goodness and mercy that He blesses even those who do not confess Christ with good marriages. I've known a lot of people who were not Christians, who were of another religion, like they were Hindus or Muslims, who have happy marriages. And why? Because basically they followed this kind of you know, outline for their marriage. Now we know that these elements also form the basis for Christian marriage because Jesus confirms that his disciples should follow these very same instructions in Matthew 19, three to six. So the element that transform a marriage based on the original model in Genesis to one that is Christian in nature is the following. Both partners are centered or committed to Jesus Christ as the Lord of their marriage. That's what makes a marriage Christian, not getting married in a church building. That should actually uh, symbolize this, but it doesn't always. In other words, when two Christians base their marriage on biblical model, then this is a Christian marriage. As I say, it's not just about getting married in the church building. So as I finish up, I, I, I ask some questions um, as before, but now I put them to two people who want to create a Christian marriage when they marry. So this is the questions that I would ask these two people. Number one, when it comes to the knowledge of self, the question is, am I a sincere Christian? You'll never know who you are meant to be or do until this issue is resolved. Being a disciple or not being a disciple will affect every other decision in your life including the one to marry. When it comes to the knowledge of the partner, the question is, is the person I'm uniting myself to a sincere Christian? Not only am I a sincere Christian, is the person I'm going to marry a sincere Christian? People foolishly relegate the religious issues to the back burner, thinking that love will conquer all. Well, religion, religion, you know, we don't, we don't want to spoil uh, you know, our love. We don't want to spoil the good thing we got going here by talking about religion. Well, we'll sort that out after we get married. Oh boy. <laughs> Sometimes that works, but I can tell you from experience, not always. What happens is that people find out that it is difficult to love and serve the Lord with a partner who doesn't believe, who doesn't care, who doesn't agree about religion or about the Bible or about Christ. You know, I come from a Catholic background, lived in a Catholic place where most people were Catholic and sometimes 
a member of the church would be married to a Catholic or wants to marry to a Catholic. Yeah, yeah, he believes in God and you know, same thing, we're the same, it's the same thing, you know? And I'd say, yeah, well, you know, maybe not. It, we're not exactly the same. Oh, no, and they just brush it all off and go ahead. You know, I don't get a vote. I'm the minister. Even the parents don't get a vote, right? You, you've heard me say that. Parents don't get a vote. They get an opinion. Maybe, if your children permit you, you, you get to give your opinion, but you don't get a vote. And certainly the minister doesn't get a vote, he may get to give you a little counsel. But then they come back after the baby is born, a couple of years later, and he wants to baptize the little baby, and she's saying, well, no, that's not baptism. Baptism is, you know, and we know what baptism is, you know. And now the fight begins. All of a sudden, somebody who had no religious convictions, it was, yeah, sure, whatever, all of a sudden, when it counts, oh, now the religious convictions come up. And I can tell the same story for some uh, young women in our congregation in Montreal who wanted to marry a Muslim man. Very nice man, good man, good to her, a moral man, didn't smoke, didn't drink, you know, really, a nice man. And oh, the religion, you believe in Jesus? Well, we believe in Jesus too, it's all good, you know? And I would say, uh, 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 you know? And then a couple of years later, the baby was born. And then our Muslim friend wanted to move back home and bring the baby and bring her back home into the Muslim country. And she started doing research about what life was like for <laughs> Christian women married to Muslim men in Muslim countries. And she didn't like what she read and yeah, sure. So am I marrying a sincere Christian? And then thirdly, the question to ask ourselves when it comes to unity, once we're married and tracing the course of our lives together, the third question that needs to be asked is, are we devoting our marriage and all it produces to Christ? Christ is not just part of one's marriage, you know, like he's got like one hour on Sunday or two. For the marriage to be Christian, Jesus has to be the Lord of that marriage and all that goes on in it. We're not ashamed to to, to put before the Lord everything that happens in our marriage. You see, marriages without Christ can succeed in this world in that they satisfy the partners, but only Christian marriages succeed in satisfying God. That's the difference. And marriages without Christ can lad, last an entire lifetime in this world but only Christian marriages succeed in transporting the partners out of this world into the next. That's the difference, that's the big difference. So it's never too early to begin building one of these Christian marriages, and it's never too late to rededicate one's life and marriage to God, no matter what, what kind of shape your marriage is in. It's never too late to kneel in prayer and say to the Lord, whatever's happened in the past is in the past, and Lord, Whatever happens in the future, we're going to devote our lives, our married life to you as best we can. That's, that's, it's never too late with God. Okay, so some ideas about what makes a marriage Christian. It's more than just getting married in the church building, okay? All right, well, we're getting close to the end of our uh, lesson series. I so thank you for your attention. We'll be back next time.